you and good morning everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our 2022-23 data release. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Beth Thompson, who serves as our Chief of Strategy and Innovation. Good afternoon, and welcome to our media briefing for the review of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools assessment results for the 22-23 school year as released by the state of North Carolina this morning. Access to this presenta presentation is available using the QR code and link currently on the screen. The link is also located on the board right over there. I'm going to give you a few minutes to access it now. Within our time together today, you're gonna to find information pertinent to Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools about the 2223 data points that the state released this morning at the State Board of Education meeting. As a reminder, over the last five years, student assessments have been impacted by two things. In the majority of assessment areas, new standards have been adopted on the timeline indicated on the screen. And assessments have been renormed. All of that has taken place at the same time we have had a pandemic which interrupted normal assessment cycles. As a result, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction publicly cautions districts from doing too much planning off of year-over-year -year comparison given the number of variables at play. Instead, action steps should be focused on where students currently are and what supports will accelerate their academic growth moving forward. I wanna start by looking at achievement levels on state assessments so we're clear on common vocabulary and descriptions about what they represent and tell us. The state provides four descriptors, not proficient, level three, level four, and level five. If a student achieves a level three on a state assessment, that student is considered grade level proficient. If a student achieves a level four or a five on a state assessment, the student is considered college and career ready. Aligned to state reporting, we're gonna report out on both descriptors today for all students throughout this presentation. When, however, we report on performance by students' racial, ethnic, specialized service, and economically disadvantaged or advantaged status, we'll do so using only level four or five, college or career ready. Additionally, before we dig in, you're gonna see acronyms today. Those acronyms are defined on this screen. EL refers to English language learners. Sometimes you see that as ML. There's a note in there to explain why those two are sometimes used. You'll see SWD for students with disabilities, AIG for academically or intellectually gifted, and EDS, which indicates economically disadvantaged as dictated by state measures. So we're gonna start with some fast facts. I call it the spoiler. All reading and math composite scores increased in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools in the 22-23 school year, including improvements in third grade literacy and high school math one, which are specific goal areas for our district. This is a, there's an increase in the number and percent of schools that were earned a school performance letter grade of an A, B, or C. That's 58% of our schools. 40 schools improved their school letter grade. 16 schools were removed from the state low performing list, but 25 schools were added, and we'll talk more about that later. There was a 0.7% decline in the graduation rate. Seven schools ranked in the top 30 in the state for overall academic growth. And we'll share with you and had the opportunity to share with our principals this morning countless areas of celebration for individual schools in the aggregate all together and also by specific grade levels and content areas. So we're going to now dig in to the required assessments. We'll start with reading grades three through eight. In reading grades three through eight in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, students increased both grade level proficiency, that's level three, four, or five, and college and career readiness, both by 2%. 
This means 47.7% of grade eight, grades three through eight students are grade level proficient in reading. And 30.5% of grades three through eight students are college and career ready in reading. I wanna spend a few minutes clarifying the difference between a level three and a level four and five, specifically in the content area of reading. Achieving a level three indicates that a student knows the content. That student is proficient. Achieving a level four or five, however, indicates that a student knows the content well enough to apply it. That student exceeds proficiency. I've heard it reported sometimes in the past that this data, when we look at it, means that only 30.5% of Charlotte Mecklenburg st students can read. Please don't report that because it's not true. Being able to read words off of a page and being able to apply reading, school, reading skills on grade level texts are two different things. I'll give you an example. You might be able to read the words in a chemistry textbook but not necessarily be able to understand them well enough to go conduct a chemistry experiment without a little help. What is true is that on North Carolina end of grade assessment, 47.7% of Charlotte Mecklenburg students demonstrated reading proficiency by responding to questions on multiple passages that require their ability to read the words, uh, apply their reading skills when reading it at a level of difficulty for their grade level. To be clear, this is beyond knowing how to read. You can see that the gains we just saw were seen across all grade levels and content areas, both in levels three, four, and five, and in levels four and five, with the exception of seventh and eighth grade reading. On average nationally, student achievement gains of between three and 5% are considered very appropriate to expect. Note here that gains in elementary grades, grades three, four, and five, were within or exceeding that three to 5% range. Gains in, gains in middle grades, six, seven, and eight, were a little lower than that average range. We're now gonna look historically at the performance of students in reading in grades three through eight. This is because, and we're gonna do that through the lens of grades uh, levels four and five only. So previously we've looked at GLP, grades uh, levels three, four, or five. Now we're gonna look at only four and five college and career readiness. This is because we set the highest of standards for our students. Our goal is that every student is a four or a five college and career ready. You'll see that after no assessments in 2019-20 due to COVID and a state renorming of the assessment as indicated by the blue line on the graph, also in 2019-20, students in grades three through eight made progress this past school year. When we look at student achievement, also college and career ready, level four or five, by racial ethnic group, it should be noted that despite gains across most groups of students, the achievement gap between the performance of white and Asian students and black and Hispanic students is wide. You're gonna see that across all of our content areas. When we look at student achievement by a specialized service area, it should be noted that the achievement gap between the performance of AIG, academically or intellectually gifted students, all students, and English language learners and students with disabilities is also wide. You will likewise see that trend across all content areas. And finally, when we look at student achievement by economically disadvantaged status, again, as defined by the state, the achievement gap between the performance of non-economically disadvantaged students, all students, and those who are economically disadvantaged is likewise wide. And you will see that trend across content areas as well. Last but certainly not least, when you look at grades 3-8 reading through the lens of comparison, both to the North Carolina average and across comparable districts throughout the state of North Carolina, you will notice that we are just under the North Carolina average in levels three, four, or five. Um, grade level proficiency, and exceeding two out of three of our comparable counties. You'll also notice that there are a lot of green arrows going up, both in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools in the area of grades three, eight reading, as well as in North Carolina and in state and in districts across the state. And we have so many schools with whom we celebrated just this morning 
who made incredible gains in reading grades 3-8. You can see just some of those schools listed here who we highlighted and celebrated and will be celebrating with their school communities this afternoon and in the days and weeks to come. It is no small feat to increase proficiency in reading. We'll now look at English 2. In English 2, a high school course, Charlotte Mecklenburg School students increased grade level proficiency by 0.9%, resulting in a proficiency rate of 59.7%, and college and career readiness, or level four or five, remained at 37.6%. This data set, similar to reading grades three through eight, shows that after no assessments in 2019-20 due to COVID, and a state renorming of the English II assessment, also in 1920, students in English II have slightly declined in performance over the last three years, remaining the same between 2021-22 and 22-23. When we look at the breakdown in college or career readiness in the content area of English II, the achievement gap between the performance of white and Asian students and black and Hispanic students remains wide. The same is true for the performance of academically gifted students, all students, English language learners, and students with disabilities, and non-economically disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged students. English to comparative performance across the state, you can see that Charlotte Mecklenburg School students exceeded the state average in level three, four, or five in English two, and exceeded two of our three comparable counties. Our students also exceeded, exceeded the state average in level four or five, college or career readiness, and um, across two, or th two out of three of our comparable counties. And just like reading grades three through eight, you'll see on this slide, so many schools had outstanding gains in English two student proficiency, both in levels three, four, or five, grade level proficiency, and in levels four or five, college and career readiness. We're now gonna switch gears from reading to math, and we're gonna start with, as we did with reading, with grades three through eight. In grades three through eight math, Charlotte Mecklenburg School students increased both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness by 3.1% and 2.9% respectively. This means that 53.1% of grades three through eight students are grade level proficient in math, levels three, four, or five, and 37.7% of grades three through eight students are college or career ready, level four or five. Get ready. When you break that down by grade level, in grade level proficiency and in college and career readiness, you see nothing but gains across every grade level. Note here, as in reading, that the gains in uh, grades three and four specifically were stronger than in middle school and within a national average for average gains um, in one year. As after a state renorming of the math assessments, reading was 2019-20 in the math assessments of 2018-19, and after no assessments in 2019-20 due to COVID, students in grades three through eight math experienced an initial decline, but have steadily increased in performance over the last three years. Despite increases across all student racial ethnic groups in 3-8 math, the achievement gap that we've seen previously remains wide. There were increases in specialized service areas and the gap remains wide. And when we look at economically disadvantaged and non-economically disadvantaged students, again, there were increases across all groups and the gap remains wide. Compared to the state and other districts in the area of grades 3-8 math, you can see that our students exceeded the state average in both levels 3, 4, or 5 and in levels 4 or 5. Let me say that again. We exceeded the state average in both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness in grades 3-8 math and exceeded two of our three comparable counties. And the gains in 3-8 math exceed even double digits, noting some of our very highest performing schools in 3-8 math had gains as high as 23 percentage points proficiency gains in one school year. And we celebrated them this morning and will continue to celebrate moving forward. What an incredible accomplishment. We're now gonna look at math one. 
and we're going to look at Math 1 in three different ways. We're going to look at students who take Math 1 in middle school, students who take Math 1 in high school, and any student who took Math 1 during the 22-23 school year regardless of grade level. Students who took Math 1 in middle school last year increased both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness by 3.5% and 6.4% respectively. That means students who took Math 1 in middle school, 87.4% of them were grade level proficient, level 3, 4, or 5, and 64.7 were college or career ready in Math 1. After, as with grades 3-8 math, you'll see that after that state renorming in 2018-19 and no assessments in 2019-20, students in Math 1 middle school experienced an initial decline, but again have increased performance over the last three years. These increases are seen across racial and ethnic student groups, across specialized service areas, and across both economically advantaged and disadvantaged groups of students. And similar to grades 3-8 math, the gains at many of our schools are tremendous. Sorry. With some of our highest gains, again, exceeding just double digits, but into the 20 and 30 point proficiency gains in one school year. I told you we were going to look at math one in three ways. We looked at middle school. Now we're going to look at high school. Students who took math one in high school last year increased both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness by 3.1% and 1.2% respectively. This means 29.4% of math one high school students are grade level proficient in math one and 9.4% of math one high school students were college and career ready level four or five. I have to admit, I saw a headline in June that gave me pause. It said, high school math students aren't proficient. And this data says that while we have a long way to go with our uh, math one students in high school, there are 29.4% of our students who did demonstrate grade level proficiency and that's a fraction of students who take Math 1 across our entire district. When we look historically at student college and career ready performance, you'll see that after that state renorming in 1819, which included a change in how the state reported Math 1 proficiency scores to only include the performance of students taking Math 1 in high school, and then again after no assessments in 2019-20, students in Math 1 experienced a sharp decline but have steadily increased in performance over the last three years albeit a slow rise. Increases are seen across most eight racial and ethnic student groups in high school math one, academically English language, academically gifted uh, English language learners and students with disabilities, and then again, economically disadvantaged and non-economically disadvantaged students. Comparatively across the state, you'll see that students were below the state average in both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness in high school math one, but exceeded two of our three comparable counties. And when we look at individual student gains in, this, in the subject area of high school math one, you'll see on this slide that there are a tremendous number of schools who experience significant gains in high school math one. Last but certainly not least, in the seemingly never-ending um, Math 1 category, I want to look at Math 1 middle and high school. So this would be any student who took Math 1 during the 22-23 school year, regardless of grade level. It's important to note that this is an unofficial calculation because the state doesn't report on this. But our amazing data analy analytics team summed the testing numerator and denominator for all students taking Math 1, and when doing so, determined 48.3% of students were grade level proficient, that's up 2.7% from last year, and 27.4% were college and career ready, that's up 2.5% from last year. So when we look at all together for Math 1, we'll see that whether students took Math 1 in middle school or in high school, there were gains in proficiency 
both in grade level proficiency levels three, four, or five, and in college and career readiness level four and five. And finally, we'll look at math three. Student performance in math three increased in both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness by 2.3% and 2% respectively. That means 59.2% of math three students were grade level proficient in math three, 39.5% were college and career ready level four or five in math three. When we look historically at performance, again, student achievement in math three has steadily increased in performance year over year for the last three years. And as we've seen in every other reading and math content area, despite increases, gaps are wide between racial and ethnic groups, specialized service groups, and between non-economically disadvantaged and economically advantaged students. When we compare to the state in terms of high school uh, math three, you'll see that our students in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools exceeded the state average in both grade level proficiency, that's levels three, four, or five, and college and career readiness, that's levels four or five in high school math three. And as with every other content area, when we needle down and look at the actual individual schools, the principals, the teachers who made this happen, there are amazing gains in the area of math three, and you can see just a few of those outlined here some of them topping in the 30% proficiency increase range. We've covered reading, we've covered math, and now we're gonna, we're gonna go to our last area, um, subject area for required assessments, that's science and biology. It should be noted that unlike reading and math, students take an end of grade assessment only in grades five and eight in the content area of science, and then they take an end of course assessment in biology. In the area of grades five and eight science, student performance in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools decreased in both grade level proficiency in college and career readiness by 1.1% and 1.4% respectively, meaning 64.3% of fifth and eighth grade students were grade level proficient, levels three, four, uh, or five, and 55% were college or career ready. When we look at those two grade levels in isolation, you'll note that there were gains in grade five and there were declines in grade eight science. When we look historically across level four or five, you'll notice that the, in the aggregate, it decreased last school year for the first time since the pandemic. And interestingly enough, when we look comparatively across the state, you'll notice that our students were below the state average and experienced declines, but the state average also declined in both grade level proficiency and college and career readiness last year. And there were several other districts who in other content areas had all green arrows increasing who also experienced declines in the area of science, grades five and eight science last year. Despite that, look at the schools and what they did. Incredible gains across so many schools. Again, we're not talking just 1% or 3%. We're talking about schools like River Oaks Academy that increased 30% in, grades five, in grade five science in grade level proficiency. And biology. In biology, student performance increased in both grade level proficiency and college career readiness by 0.1% and 1.4% respectively, meaning 50.6% of biology students were grade level proficient, level three, four, or five, and 44.6% were college or career, career ready, level four or five. Historic trends show that biology performance in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools increased for the second year in a row after the pandemic and comparative performance across, the, um, across North Carolina shows that sh biology students in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools um, came in under the state average in both levels three, four, or five, and in levels four or five, but exceeded in some of our comparable counties. Again, as every other content area, we have tremendous gains across schools in the area of biology. 
Other required assessments that the state released data around today include both the ACT and the ACT work keys. On the ACT, 44.6% of Charlotte Mecklenburg students are achieved a composite ACT score of 19 or higher in the 22-23 school year. This is a decrease of 0.5% from the previous school year. And when we look at that performance across other, as we did with other content areas, we'll note that there are disparities in achievement across both racial ethnic groups and specialized service groups. In the area of the ACT work keys, 61.1% of students earned a silver level or above. This is a decrease of 3.8% from the 21-22 school year. And again, a decline in performance and disparities across groups of students. Also released today was the four-year cohort graduation rate. The four-year cohort graduation rate for students in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools for the 22-23 school year was 82.6%. And this was down 0.7% from the 21-22 school year. Since the pandemic, we've seen a slight decline each year in the four-year cohort graduation rate. And a notable decline in our Hispanic population over the last two years specifically. We do celebrate a marked increase in the graduation rate specifically of students with disabilities in the 22-23 school year, but the gaps are still wide. And additionally, there was an increase in the graduation rate of economically disadvantaged students in the 22-23 school year. And there were schools with gains in graduation rate that deserve to be recognized and acknowledged. One area that you don't hear quite as much about, quite honestly, it's a little bit confusing to be able to track, is our English language learner progress. The Every Student Succeeds Act requires each state to provide an annual assessment of English language proficiency to all students who are identified as ELLs or English language learners. In North Carolina, that assessment is called the WIDA Access Assessment. And it literally is designed to help us know whether students for whom English is not a first language is a language that they are becoming proficient in. The initial composite score determines the number of school years that it's expected for a student before a student can exit English language learner status and defines the yearly expectation for progress in English proficiency for the students. The rate of English learner progress for the 22-23 school year was 21.4%, an increase of 4.8% from the 21-22 school year. But look at how we are compared to the rest of the state and to North Carolina. Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools boasts a higher English learner progress rate in English proficiency than both the state average and any other district um, across 22-23, which is tremendous, tremendous gains um, for our students. Up until now, we've talked about increases in proficiency, but we're now gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about academic growth. Our state uses a system you're probably familiar with we affectionately refer to it, maybe not affectionately, but we call it EVOS, which is the Education Value Added Assessment System. And you'll see by these bars that blue means that students exceeded expected growth. That means that there is an index score as determined by EVOS of a 2.1 or higher. Another designation is meeting expected growth. That would be between a negative, um, a negative two and a two. And the last designation is, is shown with the color red, which is not meeting expected growth. Simply put, the expectation is that regardless of where a student enters the year with proficiency or their achievement level, students shouldn't lose ground academically relative to their peers in the same grade 
subject or course across the state. In fact, our students should be exceeding what it takes to gain ground each year. This standard of, of what we expect, exceeding growth, is reasonable and attainable regardless of where students enter the school year. And by the way, it's the goal of our multi-tiered system of support. In 2223, 82.6% of Charlotte Mecklenburg schools met or exceeded growth. That means they were that green bar or that blue bar. That is down by just one school from the 21-22 school year and just short of our district goal of 86% for the 22-23 school year. We call that goal four. This slide shows a breakdown of the number of schools that exceeded, met, and didn't meet growth as a school in the composite for the 22-23 school year. It also shows a percentage of schools meeting or exceeding growth over the past five years. We celebrated this morning 66 Charlotte Mecklenburg schools that exceeded growth in the 22-23 school year. I want to apologize for the size of the font, but when it's 66 schools to celebrate, I'm not gonna. <laughs> Beyond that, we had 39 schools that have exceeded growth for two consecutive years. And this esteemed list of schools that have now exceeded growth for three consecutive years. <laughs> the teacher in me does it. I don't lose it. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, these schools have exceeded growth for three consecutive years. Last but certainly not least, and hot off the press, we really had to scramble to get this data today. We have schools that are ranked highest in North Carolina for growth based on their exceeded growth index, and you can see that in parentheses right here. And we sit in the media center of Renaissance West STEAM Academy that exceeded growth with an index of 10.51, and wait for it, is ranked 29 in North Carolina for highest growth index. <laughs> Principal Thompson, I get chills. <laughs> and a few tears. That's academic growth. We're now gonna talk about school performance grades. Since 2013-2014, student performance data has been used to assign letter grades to North Carolina public schools as required by North Carolina general statute. The grades are based on each school's achievement score. That has a weight of 80%. That's that level three, four, or five and each school's student's academic growth, that's what we just talked about, not meeting, meeting, or exceeding, with a weight of 20%. Note, those weights are not the same. The total school performance score is converted to a 100% point scale and then used to determine a school performance grade of A, B, C, D, or F. In the 22-23 school year, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools increased the number and percent of schools earning that A, B, or C designation, increasing 4% for a total of 58.2% of schools being designated again by the state as an A, B, or C school. Additionally, we decreased the number of D and F schools by 4%. It's not often that you see a down arrow color in the color of green, but in this case, it's a good thing that we decrease the number of DNF schools. We celebrate 40 schools in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools that improved a school performance grade and the 22-23 school year. And we have principals here today who did just that along with the staffs of their school. We look forward to hearing from them in just a few moments. And at the intersection of school performance grades and academic growth is one last additional state designation, and that's called low performing. I wanna talk you through that designation 
because it matters when we talk about what's going to come next in the 22-23 school year, what we're going to do, are already doing with students. When we consider the number of schools by state designated school performance grade um, who exceeded growth, I want you to note here that 12, 20, and 18 schools were designated with a school performance grade of an A, B, or C. And that number of schools, all of them exceeded growth. However, what you also see is that 16 schools exceeded growth but had a state performance grade, a grade of a D. You'll note right below there that those schools, regardless of their school performance grade, are not low performing. They're not low performing because they exceeded growth. They exceeded what the state expected to happen for children in their schools. So as a result, the state does not categorize them as low performing because they're making it happen at an accelerated rate for their students. And I would contend that the state knows that if that school does that year over year, those proficiency gains have to improve for children. So the state recognizes exceeding growth will result in over time and increased proficiency and those gains should be recognized by a school not being low performing. That's when schools exceed growth. When schools meet growth, however, they and have a school performance grade of a D or an F, as you see here, those schools are on the low performing list. The state is saying that just meeting growth isn't enough to close all the achievement gaps that we just saw and increase proficiency over time so all of our students are college and career ready. Just meeting growth isn't enough. Therefore, schools with a D or F later grade and meeting growth are included on the list of North Carolina low performing schools. And that final category, the category that's red, the one that says did not meet growth, it probably stands to reason that the schools that didn't meet growth and have a state designated school performance grade of a D or F are on that state low performing list. It also bears noting that there are some schools that can earn or B or a C performance letter grade, but not make growth. In summary, exceeding growth matters hugely. And when we talk about what we're doing currently in the 23-24 school year for students, we're gonna talk about exceeding growth, accelerating growth, and intensifying supports for the students who need it the most. Therefore, in summary, we had 16 schools who were removed from the state low performing list. 25 schools were added to the state low performing list. And what's important about that is it's not always the same schools that are on a low performing list year over year, although sometimes that happens, but sometimes it will be the difference between meeting and exceeding growth. So, Let's talk about how we're gonna exceed growth. At a very high level, you're gonna see accelerated growth for identified student groups. We saw all those slides about gaps. And when students need support, regardless of racial ethnic groups, specialized service, or uh, economically disadvantaged, we're gonna provide both comprehensive strategy and targeted strategy and support for students who need to grow faster. I have a feeling you're gonna hear about that from principals. We're increasing support specifically for grade eight science. We have a focused approach to student support for ACT, ACT work keys, and on-time graduation. You'll see an increased and streamlined progress monitoring effort across all, all of our schools, a comprehensive approach, an intensified use of district specialist supports targeted toward the schools that need the most support, particularly schools that you saw at the intersection of a D or F school performance grade and not meeting growth, and focus professional development to ensure consistent implementation of school-based school improvement plans. What does that mean? Every student will grow. 
and we'll do that by enacting what our school improvement plans are all aligned to, core practices across academic, behavior, social emotional learning, and attendance across our multi-tiered system of support. Our MTSS leadership team, led by Dr. Katrain Penn, was just meeting last week, and one of the consultants with whom we were working said, the function of a multi-tiered system of support in every school is so that students grow. We're enacting that multi-tiered system of support both at the district level and aligning all 184 school improvement plans to these four core areas to do just that, that our students grow. Secondly, every student receives grade level instruction and additional support as needed and appropriate. We've already started, actually already completed our back to school professional development for all teachers and staff so that everyone's clear on what expectations, what our standard for excellence is in the 23-24 school year. Next week, we start principal professional development followed by assistant principal dean and central office specialist professional development. I'm in on it too, so I'm excited on building systems for enacting and monitoring the most effective instructional practices. It's not just the practices themselves, it's the ability of amazing principals like you're gonna hear from momentarily to put the systems in place to make sure they're happening not every other day, not every third day, every minute of every day. I see heads nodding, it matters. And we have started district-wide professional development called Capturing Kids Hearts. Cohort one is in motion right now, and we have a multi-year implementation so that all 184 schools have received that professional development within three years. But it's focused on student and staff, well-being, positive culture, and connectedness. And our learning community superintendents who are here with us today say they have not heard one complaint. And y'all, sometimes we get complaints about things. They have not heard one complaint about this professional development from staff members at the 63 schools that have completed training so far. I talked about progress monitoring. We'll have robust um, strategy for progress monitoring student performance with the implementation of new quarterly benchmark assessments in all of the tested areas you just saw so that every quarter we know who learned what was just taught. And if they didn't learn it, we know how to then be able to provide targeted support. We'll have district-wide data analysis sessions. All schools will participate in quarterly to do just what we talked about. Looked at, look, at those, uh, look at those results and determine what next steps look like. And upon looking at that data on a quarterly basis, be able to determine which schools need intensified support for the upcoming quarter. And our learning communities will host quarterly data sharing sessions to enable principals to be able to share best practice where they've seen gains so that we're not just celebrating at the end of the year, but we're celebrating areas of progress all year long and being able to replicate those um, throughout the school year. Every student will learn behavioral expectations. Every school, as a part of their back to school plan, has a behavior matrix for students. Every school administrative team has a discipline matrix to ensure consistent opportunities for students to learn what they should be doing and to ensure our administrators are able to consistently act when students aren't meeting those expectations. Additional district supports in the area specifically of behavior include restorative practices staff development, that's a continuation, and capturing kids' heart staff development, which we just saw. Every student receives needed social emotional support. Every school has a core plan for providing that social emotional learning for all K-12 students. We'll continue use of the Panorama Education Survey to measure social emotional skills and supports. We'll continue implementation of trauma-informed practices, including handle with care implementation when students need it. And district supports in the form of counselors, social workers, Scott psychologists, and mental health therapists will continue to be available in the upcoming school year. And last but certainly not least, every student needs to come to school every day. 
In order to support that, every school has a tiered attendance plan for the 23-24 school year using strategies from Attendance Works. District supports specific to the area of attendance include ongoing progress monitoring, not just in the aggregate, but also by specific groups of students so that we can make sure we're attending to all student needs and getting to the root cause of why students aren't coming to school if that's true for them. A growing need in our community is the ability to have language assistance when we're seeking to try to get students um, in school. And we're currently enacting a spe specialist support um, for plan development to support schools in doing that. And at this very moment in time, we are in the middle of conducting what I call phase one of all of this, which is making sure we know exactly where, um, exactly which students have not arrived at school yet, and making home visits and repeated contacts to be able to make sure we can, we can locate those students and help them get to school. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Hill for some closing comments, and then I'll introduce and welcome our principals um, for remarks. All right, thank you, Beth, for that very uh, comprehensive overview. Um, we have a lot to celebrate today. We've experienced an increase in the percent of students achieving grade level proficiency and college career ready readiness in most grade level content areas across all student groups. There is a cause for celebration across several of our schools and you saw that today on the screen. We are very proud that we've increased the number of schools with a school performance grade of an A, B, or C, and we've decreased the number of schools with a school performance grade of a D or an F. The growth we've made as a whole is incremental. The gaps between our white and Asian students and our non-white students groups existed before the pandemic and they persist. We must accelerate the growth of our students, especially among our diverse groups of students. All of our schools must exceed growth this school year. The label of low performing schools that some of our schools have received is an indication of how schools performed as a whole during the past school year. This label is not an indication or reflection of the potential of our students our community, or the ability of our teachers and administrators. What it does signal is that we as a school system have not adequately provided a comprehensive strategy of support and associated resources to the schools that need us the most. Simply put, we have operated as a district of schools instead of a school system. We now have strategies of support and Beth shared those um, just a minute ago, and they've all been in place since before school started. We will be working alongside with our schools and providing the resources necessary to ensure our students exceed expected growth. Again, exceeding growth is the new standard. I like to say we have to beat the GPS. With any data and news that you receive, I was taught a long time ago by um, one of my mentors. He always gave us the 24-hour rule. So anytime you receive any news, and typically we exercise it all around the, 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 the use of data, we're going to celebrate for 24 hours, and then some of us are a little mad and upset and want to throw some things across the room for 24 hours. 24 hours is all we get. Then we start over because we've got to go to work. We cannot live in a state of celebration or being mad. We've got to get to work because our students deserve um, our very best. One of the things that I love about Mecklenburg County is everyone wants to lean in and all have expressed interest in the success of our students. And I think that's evidenced by today. We are extremely grateful for our community partners and the engagement of our parents and families. But it is time for all of us to step up and raise the bar. We must be united in our unwavering support for our students and the educators that serve them daily. I'm thankful for a Board of Education that takes a hard stand on setting priorities focused on what schools are designed to do, and that is focus on positive outcomes for students. So at this time, I just want to call out um, our chairperson, uh, Lee Stashew, who is not here, 
She um, was on a flight and has been um, delayed for over 24 hours, so she would be here. We do have our vice chair, uh, Stephanie Sneed, with us this morning. Thank you for being here. Board member Lenora Sanders Schiff is here with us, and also board member Jennifer De La Hara is here with us, so thank you for being here. Last but certainly not least, I want to say a huge thank you to all of our educators in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. We have talented and passionate educators who work with our students and your children, also my children, every single day.